thank you so much for joining us. We have an excellent lineup this afternoon. I am very excited to listen and learn. Uh, our panel is entitled Material Culture, Memory and Mobility. Our panelists will each have 15 minutes to give their papers and then we'll do questions in clusters of three or four at the end. And we will just go in the order that the panelists are listed uh, on the program. So we will start with Elizabeth Fretwell of Old Dominion University, who will be speaking on seamstresses, artisan workshops and mobility in central Benin, West Africa, 1960s to 1980s. All right, so my screen's fine, everyone see it? Okay, great. Um, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for organizing this panel. Um, my paper today draws upon research for um, my book manuscript that I'm currently drafting uh, from my dissertation research, which was on artisan tailoring and tailored clothing in central Benin or Dahomey from the 18th century to the recent past. So my work focuses on tailors, both male and female, reflecting the fond gender neutral word, uh, nutoto. But I'm using seamstresses in the title of this paper just for clarity. Um, although I usually refer to women who design cut and sew clothing as tailoring women. Um, so my larger project is on tailors work, designing, producing and selling clothing and how tailors and tailored clothing served as mediators of identity and affinity in 20th century Benin. Ultimately, I show how making clothes was also this process of giving form to ideas and experiences of gender and ethnicity, nationality, urbanity, and Africanness. In doing so, I point to the importance of considering Taylor's craft knowledge, their labor, and the various material inputs and technologies of production within the histories of clothing and fashion and everyday life in West Africa. So this paper is gonna draw from the tail end of this project, the period of the 70s and the 80s, when both fashion and tailoring in Central Beginning became thoroughly feminized. So drawing upon the theme of this conference, mobility, and archival research, newspapers, oral history, photographs, and material culture, I argue that the mobility of labor, of skills and expertise, and of materials, as well as perceptions of the immobility of workshop space and the bodies within, allowed women to create new individual, collective, and gendered futures as tailoring women. So growing up in the village of Bopa in southeastern Benin in the early 1970s, Seraphine Hogbandan often traveled with her parents to the periodic market in Abame, a somewhat sleepy regional town that had once been the capital of the pre-colonial kingdom of Dahomey. So during one of these trips, Hogbandan first saw a tailoring woman and was immediately impressed by the woman, her work, and her workshop. Hogbandan begged her father to pay for an apprenticeship contract with the patron or master tailor but he refused and insisted that she continue to sell food in the local market. Dissatisfied with his response, Hogbadon fled on foot to Abome to find the master tailor. Now, by declaring herself an orphan, Hogbadon was able to bypass the parental permission necessary to enter an apprenticeship, but she still lacked the contract fees that all Beninwa apprentices pay to artisan masters. So Hogbadon spent most of her time with the tailor working off her debt by performing domestic tasks in return for scraps of food, instead of learning how to design, cut, and sew clothes. Discouraged and hungry, a teenage Hogbadon threatened to throw herself into a well, until a neighbor who also hailed from her village gave her the money to return home. So a few years later, um, now with one failed marriage behind her and in her early 20s, Hogbadon once again returned to Abame to a different tailoring woman and panhandled her apprenticeship fees. This period of her life had a significant impact on Hogbadon, and she described how Abamans regularly mocked her for her advanced age, you know, as for an apprentice, her poverty, and her so-called village wall ways. So she was unable to afford the machinery and the documentation uh, and the ceremony that's necessary to become a master artisan in Benin. Um, so Hogbadon moved to Abiokuta, Nigeria with a man, and there she worked odd jobs, including as a mason's assistant hauling bags of cement on her head. Eventually, she purchased a sewing machine and began to make clothing for the large community of Bidinwa migrants in Abiokuta before they, along with all other migrants, were expelled in 1983 by the Nigerian government. 
So back in Abame now, once again, Hugmanon opened a workshop and began to sew models that she had learned during her apprenticeship and during her time in Nigeria. She finally became a success and her shop flourished. By 2015, she had liberated over 60 apprentices and even sent a daughter to university. So Hogmanon ended her life story by telling us how, despite her father's lack of aid and support for her, she had paid for his funeral. She declared, quote, that among all of my father's children, I am the only one with an occupation now, the only one with some value. Tailoring had provided a pathway for her to go from a self-described exploited village girl to a well-respected mama, a patron of an important ta Abamean tailoring shop, and a full member of the greater community of Beninwa craftspeople. So while Hogbadon's life history is likely exceptional because of the number of challenges that she faced and because of her flair for constructing an epic narrative of her journey from rags to relative riches, her story also exemplifies how the experience and work of being a tailoring woman was shaped by the movements of bodies, of skills and expertise, and of objects, affecting not just how women made clothes and the styles that they made, but also how women came to see themselves in their place in the world. So migrations from village to town and within the region and then the settling in the workshop allowed women self-described as poor peasants or orphans, a means of achieving autonomy for male relatives, a measure of material success, and most of all, new forms of respectability. Their notions of respectability reflected local ideas about motherhood and the value of dependence. They also reflected Christian norms around modest women and their enclosure in private space. And they also reflected what Jennifer Hart has called entrepreneurial respectability, which quote, emphasized accumulation, autonomy, and mobility, and facilitated the care of extended family and access to imported goods and other commodities. So women's strategies for achieving this respectability were material. They carefully dressed themselves and their apprentices to project their authority and prosperity, and their adornments and constructions of the interiors and exteriors of workshops carved out new urban feminine spaces. The story of seamstresses in their workshops reveals how women created a presence in an increasingly anonymous post-colonial urban center and how, despite economic insecurity, women enacted new futures through the discussion, design, and production of closed bodies and professional space, so clothed bodies. So um, as Hopanon's multiple migration suggest, the techniques and forms of tailoring flourished in 20th century Benin through mobility and networks of exchange. So other, unlike in other parts of West Africa, such as the Muslim Sahel or neighboring Yoruba land, where there were longstanding traditions of sewn dress, the Fon speakers of central Bedin wore mostly wrapped and draped cloth well into the colonial period. Um, although, you know, they had long been integrated into African and Atlantic trading networks. And so um, this did translate into some measure of sewn dress, particularly among elites, right? But by the 1940s, ordinary men and women began to supplant, supplant wrappers um, with fitted clothing. So uh, ambitious young men, and this one's not, no longer young, but who were often the sons of peasants and descendants of captive outsiders, took up tailoring in large numbers in the 1950s, working out of regional markets and culling inspiration and stylistic know-how from imported catalogs and secondhand short improvement courses with other tailors and through adventuring or travel and work in different cities and towns in Boycon, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire and beyond. So the everyday innovations of these men in clothing production led to the foundation of what Beninwa call hukuchur or the technique, creativity and taste necessary to make all types of men and women's clothing. So at the same time as this, there was a parallel system of sewing um, developing among women. So the small number of women sewing for profit in Benin um, were usually the wives of middle-class men making clothing for children and women, a set of techniques and forms that Benin Wall call couture dame. So these women often trace their craft knowledge back to missions and colonial programs that sought to domesticate women. So scholars of course have shown the important role that Christian missions played in promoting sewn dress and linking them to ideas of respectability throughout Africa. Uh, but in Benin, Fon Vudun maintained its stronghold on religious life and the role of missions was relatively weaker. So in practice, the mission origins of craft knowledge of couture dame often meant that women 
um, lacked the extensive catalog of styles and skills as compared to their male counter counterparts. But by the 1960s and 70s, practitioners of haute couture and couture dame began to merge as tailors organized themselves into craft specific organizations to regulate apprenticeship and master tailor status. So as part of this professionalization that's occurring at this time, they also moved their place of production from the interiors of regional markets to the workshop. Encouraged to move indoors by the expansion of the electrical grid and by changing notions about the prestige of workshop based operations, tailors opened shop and rented spaces on newly paved roads within the growing towns. The most successful tailors installed glass windows and purchased imported mannequins, allowing unknown passerby to absorb the newest styles and to judge the skills of the individual tailor. Less well-off tailors simply hung clothing, oh, sorry, um, simply hung clothing on um, racks on these, these uh, handmade mannequins. And these private workshop spaces that became spaces where ordinary people met and engaged in ongoing conversations about clothing, the newest styles and their costs, who was wearing them, who wasn't, and what they said about the wearer. But they also became places where um, men and particularly women could gossip or chat about politics. So the shift to workshop-based production occurred in tandem with more women entering the craft um, amid increased demand for fitted clothing. So here you have um, examples of these sort of like top-down efforts um, in the 1960s and 70s for nationalist governments to promote, you know, certain types of men's or women's fashion. So this feminization of tailoring um, of dress, really, of fashion is, is coming from that as well as the actions of um, women's seamstresses. So the, um, the shift to workshop-based tailoring or workshop-based production occurred in tandem with more women entering the craft amid increased female demand for fitted clothing. Most other urban women, such as market women and vendors of prepared food, sold their goods or plied their trade in the street. Yet workshops for couture dame were literally walled off feminine spaces full of girls and women working and consuming. In oral histories, hairdressing was often con contrasted with tailoring to emphasize the relationship between mobility, space, and the respectability of craftswomen. Non-literate women, women with few resources often chose between the two crafts, and many decided upon tailoring because of perceptions of mobile hairdressers as lacking in respectability when compared to women fixed in the workshop. Hairdressers often traveled to people's homes or in front of them to work, putting them in the enclosed spaces of non-relative men, or as in that picture of the young woman braiding in the streets of Abame, forcing them to work in the street. Um, Taylor Jean Hanu underscored this difference when she told me that girls who do hair move around a lot. They crawl along everywhere, but sewing. When a girl comes to a workshop, it is to work. When she leaves, it is to go home. Um, another tailor had changed her pr profession from hairdressing to tailoring because she claimed, here people consider the majority of women hairdressers as prostitutes. I stopped doing hair because people considered me a prostitute. So fiancés and husbands likewise persuaded partners to learn tailoring, a craft that men with middle-class aspirations recognize as well-suited to the status of the wife of a civil servant. Husbands also recognize the particular legibility of women in workshop-based tailoring as affecting their ability to survey their wives. So Jean Agadame's husband did not want her to engage in market commerce because of the mobility of market women. She remembered, quote, he did not want me to go out like that. He wanted me to stay in the workshop where he can see me. But jealous husbands also recognized that women working in female spaces permitted them a measure of autonomy over their own bodies. One woman at her husband's request left the higher status work of a stenographer um, for a male civil servant to, um, in the confines of an office to become a tailoring woman and master of her own autonomous workshop. So women tailors um, achieved respectability in part by filling workshops with apprentices. Master tailors finalized the design and did the cut, but they relied on apprentices 
usually in their teens and sometimes younger, to do much of the actual sewing and pressing. Often apprentices like those of Elizabeth Sudokbo wore uniforms and not just for celebrations like in this liberation, but also on an everyday basis. Men too often required uniforms for their apprentices and these practices of uniforming materialize not only the horizontal affiliations of apprentices, but also their status as a dependent of a master tailor. Girl apprentices called their master mama, even if she was childless. And as a mama, that woman gained respect in her community. In this image, a smiling Marie Felicite Bagbeto, a boycon tailor, sits surrounded by her apprentices in her workshop. In the other photo, it's her father um, surrounded by a different group of apprentices. So the staging of both of these photographs suggests that Bagabeto and her father were proud of the girl apprentices as their presence heightened um, both the status of the woman as a patron of a shop and also solidified her role as a mama. And then a tailor's network would of course grow larger um, as she graduated apprentices or as her apprentices finished their um, their, their time learning the craft. Um, and so these apprentices, now masters, would take on their own apprentices, and these multiple generations of women would approach the original master as an authority, not only in sewing and style, but also as someone who could provide them in advice and help them in other aspects of life. Okay. So um, Briefly, I've tried to show how the, developing, the development of tailoring and a fitted sartorial culture in Benin was a product of mobility, right? The everyday innovations of male tailors drew upon their ability to gather materials from abroad and elsewhere in Africa, and then travel refined their cosmopolitan expertise and style. Yet by the 1970s, the craft and fashion had become feminized and partially immobilized within workshop walls. This new feminine space of couture dame uh, created opportunity and respectability for the individual woman tailor, even as it cloistered them and made their daily activities legible to husbands and others. Yet women's tendency, tendency to take on a large number of apprentices, as we just saw, would eventually help reduce the overall prestige and profitability of the craft. So by the 1980s, the fortunes of both male and female tailors started to slip into decline, even as the number of tailors grew, um, and even as demand for tailor, tailored clothing increased um, with new streams of inexpensive imported cloth. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we will go ahead and, and move along to our next paper, which will be given by Molly McCullers at the University of West Georgia, who is gonna be speaking on Paradise Drive and Cars, Safari and Imperial Imaginaries in 20th Century Southern Africa. All right, thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Okay, I am going to attempt to share my screen here. All right, is that working? Can somebody confirm? Yes, no. Yes, yes, it's right. working. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so Paradise Drive-In, Cars, Safari, and Empire in the Kruger National Park uh, to 1955. So glamorous old Africa with its trading safaris, its slavers, ivory hunters, and adventurer persists today only in scattered segments and in memories. Before the onslaught of civilization, the enchanted frontiers of that land of adventure receded, and such remnants as remain of the once mighty whole do so through extreme isolation or the wisdom of man. So it is with the Kruger National Park. Those are the opening lines of a 1954 travel guide to South Africa's Kruger National Park, one of the world's premier safari destinations. Safari is the quintessential experience of African tourism. It's a journey into timeless nature, seemingly untouched by human encroachment and the bustle of modern life. Over the 20th century, as industrialization progressed at an astounding rate, the romantic ideal of the African safari gained tremendous popularity among both Western metropolitan and African colonial settler populations. As one travel guide described it, 
The ideal of the Kruger National Park was, quote, only 250 miles from the industrial behemoth of Johannesburg and linked by an excellent macadamized highway. And so here is a map of all of your excellent roads and macadamized highways to the Kruger National Park uh, from cities such as uh, Pretoria, Johannesburg, uh, and Durban. And so this paper is a very preliminary foray into a larger project examining the ways in which automobility, cars and roads, and the experience of safari tourism shaped English and Afrikaans speaking Southern Africans' identities in relation to whiteness, masculinity, and empire in the 20th century. The scope of this paper is circumscribed to the car's integral role in the development of the Kruger National Park in safari tourism as part of English speaking South Africans' cultural imaginary of the British Empire. Between the park's initial constitution in 1926 and South Africa's departure from the Commonwealth under the apartheid government in 1961. I argue that safari permitted white, predominantly English speaking South Africans, a means to fashion themselves as imperial citizens by enacting a colonial journey of exploration and time travel into a supposedly pristine wilderness via the paradoxically ultra modern automobile. The rapid 20th century expansion of national parks with networks of roads in Southern Africa, most notably in Kruger, provided Imperial citizens an opportunity to in indulge in a reenactment of Turner's frontier thesis by envisioning themselves as pioneers, blazing paths through the wilderness in rustic automotive luxury. The car afforded white elites with an, a, a sense of nostalgic return noted by scholars of Imperial tourism and safari. As Theodore Roosevelt famously described his safari in East Africa as, quote, a journey into the Pleistocene while riding on the cow catcher of the steam engine on the Lunatic Express or the Uganda Railway, his ultra-modern transport accentuated the dissonance and the sense of a journey back in time. Vacationing in these contrived, pristine, and unpeopled environments provided respite from the headaches, the noise, and squalor of Western and Southern African urban industrial cities ironically considered one of imperialism's crowning achievements in the heyday of segregation. It was the car that physically connected, but, sorry, lost my place, that physically connected, but also mentally distanced the colonial realities of human and environmental exploitation in South Africa and the heroic recuperation of nature in the safari park. The car also transformed the embodied experience of safari by making the African wilderness more accessible while simultaneously physically separating people from the bush and setting engagement with nature at a remove. This paper and the larger project attempt to articulate two bodies of somewhat disparate scholarship on safari and the car. Scholarship of safari has considered the implications of race and imperialism, particularly in the simplified and romanticized tropes of the white hunter explorer scientist and the African guide trustee or object of inquiry. Jacob Lumini's recent work, Safari Nation, has pushed back against these reifying categorizations and challenged the idea of safari as a solely white preserve. However, because of its reliance on the car, for most of the 20th century, safari tourism was an almost exclusively white and initially elite activity. It is essential to interrogate how wide-scale safari tourism constructed popular collective identities that were differently inflected by race, ethnicity, class, gender, and imperialism in Southern Africa. Likewise, automobility scholarship broadly has emphasized the modernity of the car and debated its Western ethos of freedom. As Africanist studies of automobility demonstrate, the advent of the car was, quote, the single most important factor for change in Africa in the 20th century, end quote. Even though and because car ownership continues to be out of reach for many, if not most Africans. However, by the end of the 20th century, white South Africans were among the world's most prolific car owners. I argue that car ownership became an important component of white South Africans' imperial identities, which demonstrated their belonging to and or equivalency with the metropole and Western modernity. Gavald, Luning, and Van Alveren contend that in Africa, the car led to, quote, the development of and accessing of a completely new, of new markets, as well as the establishment of a completely new economy centered around motor vehicles. The Kruger Park and safari tourism were one such facet of this new economy. Although the idea of creating a wildlife preserve, which would become the Kruger National Park, was first brought up in 1884, the land was not declared to be a national park until 1926. This was in fact a fortuitous time for the birth of the Kruger Park, 
because it coincided with the rise of the automotive industry in the country. Ford opened a manufacturing plant in South Africa in 1923, which was soon followed by General Motors, making cars for the first time somewhat readily accessible for those with the financial resources to purchase them. At the time, white English speakers tended to be the most affluent sector of society and were perhaps the most likely to be the early car owners. Indeed, the Kruger Park could not likely not have survived without a reasonably large population of private car owners. And this is arguably one of the main reasons for the long delay between the park's inception as an idea and its eventual fruition. Colonel James Stevenson Hamilton, who was the first warden of the Kruger Park and one of the individuals most responsible for its existence, credited the park's survival and thriving in the face of numerous initial threats to white car owners. South Africa had become a world leader in wildlife preservation precisely because of, quote, a large white population nearby, end quote, to provide, quote, a traveling public, which could be educated to appreciate animals and the environment for their intrinsic value by photographing them from their cars. Stevenson Hamilton viewed imperial modernity as both a scourge of Africa and its remnant. He lamented the destructive wave of the 19th century on the African environment, although he rarely mentions its people, and the automobile's role in granting unscrupulous white hunters with unprecedented access to game, leading to a sharp decline in animal populations. It was precisely these circumstances which necessitated the creation of national parks, in which the automotive safari vacation was also the best way to, quote, curb humans' dangerous impulses against animals. I'm going to actually skip forward. The objective of a national park was to, quote, show the public what the earth looked like before a human presence, end quote, and encourage the motoring tourists to, quote, fall victim to the strange spell which untrammeled nature nearly always imposes. And so you can see here uh, efforts to encourage uh, photography instead of hunting, to bring them back in your camera as you lean out of the window of your car. And to this end, Stevenson Hamilton's first order of business when the Kruger National Park was proclaimed in 1926 was to open the park to the public as quickly as possible. Consequently, road construction was a priority. This work was initially carried out by park staff entirely by hand. They managed to construct 200 miles of dirt road within the first year of the park's opening, during which 240 cars carrying 800 people visited the park. By 1930, there were 500 miles of road and four pontoon bridges. By 1938, there were 1,200 miles of road with concrete bridges crisscrossing the park. That year, 38,000 visitors and over 10,000 cars and trucks came to view the wildlife. And in order to make all of this possible, uh, of course, rest camps were established uh, and you can see here uh, early automobiles photographed at the rest camps, as well as the traditional tropes um, of the white tourist and the African trustee or guide, and also the juxtaposition uh, of very modern automobiles with uh, traditional rondavels um, or traditional style buildings. As well, gas stations uh, were established uh, at each of the 14 rest camps with two full service garages uh, for far more serious car troubles. And in his 1938 book, Our South African National Parks, which was published side by side in English and, and Afrikaans, Stevenson Hamilton spills much ink on the importance of the car to the park's survival, but also to driver etiquette and road safety, commenting that people have to be forcibly saved from bringing trouble on themselves and others by having a sign pasted to their windshield reading, stay in your car and keep to the road. Um, and so here we've got uh, signs about how you should not get out of your car uh, lest you be attacked by a lion, but also to slow down uh, in order to not hit the game. Stevenson Hamilton wrote largely from the perspective of the man ultimately responsible for the safety of man and beast while other authors produced numerous adventure accounts and travel guides for the park, which were far more clearly geared toward the white tourist and contributed to the construction of a particular type of imperial identity. One of the earliest works about the Kruger Park is C.A. Yates's 1935, The Kruger National Park, Tales of Life Within Its Border. Yates was the brother-in-law of uh, 
ranger Henry Volhutter, who was Stevenson Hamilton's right-hand man and eventually a prominent subject in South, Africa boy, South African boys' adventure literature. Yates paints life in the park as one of excitement in which each visitor may aspire to the likes of David Livingston, Robert Baden-Powell, Frederick Courtney Sellis, and even Henry Volhutter all heroes of the British Empire and archetypes of the best that Britain had to offer the world, even despite Volhutter's at least partially Afrikaans heritage. On the title page, Yeats places himself squarely aspiring to this mold by referring to himself as ex-scoutmaster, first Barberton troop. He gives a hagiographic hey description of the first park rangers as unostentatiously devoting themselves to their task, often under circumstances of considerable difficulty and peril. Indeed, he hoped his book would, quote, appeal to the character, by the character of its contents, to the members of that worldwide brotherhood, which promotes, as one of its chief aims, the healthful training of a scout in the open, where the sights and sounds of the glorious realm of nature delight the keen observer with their infinite variety, end quote. After all, the Kruger Park, he said, was a magnificent asset, not only of the Union of South Africa, but also to the whole of the British Empire. Although many of Yeats's adventures took place on foot or horseback, he nevertheless described the Kruger Park as, quote, the Mecca of lovers of the wild, in which every year thousands of them make the pilgrimage thither in their motor cars as they speed along the winding tracks, imbibing in the glories of animal life. For Yeats, the safari was the antidote to the stresses of modern life, bringing invigoration and refreshment to nerves and minds jaded by the humdrum routine of the modern struggle for existence, end quote and allowing one's personal worries to be forgotten for a while. And indeed, the world of adventure, exploration, imperial values, and timelessness invoked by Yeats in his depiction of the Kruger Park is a trope that continued into the tourist literature into the 1950s. An extended tourist brochure entitled South Africa's Animal Kingdom, written by noted South African travel and adventure writer T.V. Bolpin, and produced by the South African government explicitly for the Anglo-American tourist market, almost shamelessly exploits these stereotypes. In addition to the outlandish passage with which I began this paper, Wolpen described Kruger as, quote, a wild garden of the great god Pan, where the adventurous could drink their fill of a roving life. Amidst florid and prolix prose, Wolpen's brochure is an extremely practical guide to undertaking a car safari at Kruger and is packed with fantastically garish roadmaps, advertisements, and images enticing the reader to jump in a car and motor to the park post haste. Although Bolpin never explicitly addressed race, it's clear from the, the photos and pricing information on the services of various, quote, native servants, that a car safari and its attendant imperial exploits and opportunities for relaxation were exclusively for white potential tourists. And so as you can see, uh, from the pictures and the description, uh, life in the camps is delightfully different. Uh, you can enjoy the traditional bry flies when the meat is grilled over the open fire. And there are also simple restaurants for the traveler. And so you've got the lovely white family coming in greeted by the African chef. And again, you have, uh, even in the 1950s, the modern car, the traditional rondavel, uh, and then the ideal uh, white family with the African guide sitting to the side. This brochure concluded 44 pages later with a testament to South Africa's awareness of its responsibility to preserve wildlife for the world and posterity, as well as, to contact, as, well as with contact information for the South African Tourist Corporation offices in London, New York, Nairobi, and Pretoria. Although there is much to unpack and little time or space to do so, I hope that this paper serves to begin a larger conversation and investigation into the mutual constitution of cars and safari tourism in South Africa and the roles they played in shaping particular settler and imperial tourist subjectivities as citizens of a modern empire of conservation. So I will stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have Ashley Parcells from Jacksonville University, whose paper is entitled, Our Language and Customs Are Swazi, But We Are Zulu, Chieftaincy, Ethnicity, and Sovereignty in Inguaguma. I think you're muted, 
Yeah, we can't hear you, Ashley. Okay, got it. Got it. Um, this is like the 2020, 2021 problem. Okay, so in 1982, South Africa announced that it would transfer Ingwamuma and Kangwane to Swaziland. Kangwane was a self governing Bantu um, in the Eastern Transvaal for ethnic Swazis, reportedly. While Inguambuma was a region of northern Natal that was to become part of the Swazulu Bantustan. The Swazi royal house maintained throughout the 20th century that these territories were rightfully part of Swaziland. South Africa offered this land deal in 1982 in exchange for a secret non aggression pact in which Swaziland agreed to clamp down on anti apartheid, primarily ANC operations within its borders. The announcement of the land transfer incited fierce debates about history, ethnicity, and the sovereignty of Bantustan governments. My broader research is focused on the politics of state formation in the KwaZulu Bantustan in South Africa. Um, and this presentation is a very small part of a larger chapter I've written in the past year on the Inglamuma crisis. Here I'm going to actually take us back further in the 1970s when a chieftaincy dispute in the Ungamazulu chiefdom sparked new politics over land and identity in this region. Two claimants, Katoyo and Ntunda Ungamazulu, framed their legitimacy and their claims to power through attachment to either the KwaZulu government or the Swazi king. The violence of the secession dispute forced, I argue, the hardening of categories of Zulu and Swazi identity in this region sparking some of the initial discussions by the mid-1970s of a land transfer. So first I want to talk a little bit about this kind of very complicated zone we're dealing with. Inguvuma is a frontier zone on the edges of the expansion of the Swazi and Zulu kingdoms, but also on the frontiers of British, Boer, and Portuguese colonialism. The 19th century history of Nguyen is shaped by these more relationships with these powerful African states and European imperial powers. In 1895, after some rather complex imperial maneuvering that's been well documented by scholars like Patrick Harris, Nguyen was incorporated first into Zululand, then into the colony of Natal, and then eventually um, it's going to be incorporated into South Africa. For the first 75 years after it's incorporated into Zululand and becomes on its way to being part of South Africa, people move with relative ease um, and maintain social and political relationships across the South African, Swaziland, and Mozambican borders. And the categories of Zulu and Swazi are by no means the primary forces shaping politics, daily life, or self identification in this region. So England Lewis chiefdoms, a couple of them on the western part of the district, actually straddle this international border. Members of the chiefly families in England Luma simultaneously married into the Swazi royal house um, and sent their sons to be educated with Zulu heirs in Nongoma. During the 1940s, between half and two thirds of the followers of the Ngomazulu chief actually lived in Swaziland. And the chief himself periodically stayed in Swaziland, much to the annoyance of white officials in South Africa's Department of Native Affairs who insisted that he was a South African chief. So I wanna emphasize that rather than trying to categorize this region as Zulu and Swazi, um, it really must be seen first and foremost as a border community where people develop networks that stretched across officially recognized political spheres. These politics though come to a head in the 1970s as the creation of the KwaZulu Bantustan collides with the expansionist aims of a newly independent Swaziland. And these notions of a strict division between Zulu and Swazi ethnicity begin to drastically reshape politics in this region. The catalyst was a secession dispute in the Ngomazo chiefdom, which is this middle one in the western part of the district. 
South Africa's Department of Bantu Administration and Development had initially appointed Nkunja Ngomazu as chief in 1972. According to government informants, however, between five to 10% of the residents of this chiefdom actually supported Ketuayo, Ntunja's half brother. After Ntunja officially became chief, this dissident faction petitioned the government to remove him. Due to this unrest, South Africa's Department of Bantu Administration and Development appoints a one man commission to investigate. This commission released two bulky reports, scandalously claiming that Ntunja was actually not the son of the late chief, and instead was an illegitimate offspring from his mother's extramarital affair. In 1973, South Africa deposes Ntunja and appoints Katoyo as chief. This appointment, though, sets off years of instability and violence in this region. Ntunja and several hundred followers flee into Swaziland. Back in Ingwambuma, Katayo supporters burn down the homes that have been abandoned by those who left. Several murders occur on both sides of this dispute. By the height of the crisis, Swaziland will claim that it's hosting about 20,000 refugees from this chieftaincy dispute. Well, other numbers will say close closer to around 6,000. While the discrepancy between these figures are high, they show regardless that this chieftaincy dispute had spiraled into a transnational crisis. While the politics on the ground of Zulu versus Swazi identity were complex and fluid, the South African government, the Swazi-Lubantistan government, the press, and nationalists in Swaziland frame the secession dispute as a struggle between Zulu and Swazi identities. On the other side of the border, Swazi leaders begin to link Ntunja's claim with this assertion that Ingwaguma was ethnically Swazi and should be transferred to Swaziland. One newspaper editorial, for example, claims that the apartheid government had only deposed the chief because he had refused to join the Kwazulu government. Mangosu Tupapulezi, uh, Kwazulu's leader, denounced the idea of a land transfer, asserting that the land belonged to Kwazulu. So this chieftaincy dispute spirals into this major transnational conflict over land and identity. And I want to caution, though, that contrary to government assumptions, in Ingwaguma itself, even the positions on the chieftaincy dispute did not cleanly align with sentiments of Zuluness versus Swaziness. And the crisis and how it's reported largely obscures the history of shifting and nuanced political allegiances in this region. Faced with this crisis that just would not dissipate, in 1976, the apartheid government forms a massive interdepartmental committee to deal with the chieftaincy dispute. From the beginning, the committee frames it again as this issue of Zulu versus Swazi identity. There were proposals being made in the press, for example, that the chieftain should be transferred to Swaziland or at the very least be made part of the new Swazi territorial authority in the Transvaal, or what would become Kangwane. The testimonies given before this committee leaned heavily towards Ketwaya, the pro kwazulu chief. And it demonstrates the stakes of this dispute for the KwaZulu government, for South Africa, and for some of the people in this district. Representatives from the KwaZulu government testified that even if the people here were Swazi, the territory, the land, were Zulu. Mangasutu Butzelezi uh, portrayed Ndunja, the pro chief in exile, or the deposed chief who was in exile in Swaziland, as a product of adultery and a pawn in Swaziland's scheme to, in his words, see Zulu territory and gain access to the sea. The KwaZulu delegation rejected proposals that any land be removed from KwaZulu, 
insisting that, quote, the fact that the Umgoma Zulu can be classified as Swazi does not distract from the fact that the land belongs to KwaZulu, end quote. For KwaZulu, this conflict was not just about Ingwanduma, but it's about the territorial integrity of this new Bantustan. They objected that allowing the land to this area to leave KwaZulu in one form or another, whether to go to Swaziland or become part of a Swazi territorial authority, would encourage other minority groups within KwaZulu, um, including Pondo speakers in the southern part of the Bantustan and Fubi speakers, um, to try to break away from the Bantustan, potentially destabilizing the entire project. In my broader research, I've shown that in the 1960s, questions about the boundaries of Zulu ethnicity had actually led to the proposal that the government create several territorial authorities or future Bantustans um, within the province of Natal in South Africa. And ultimately, they did choose to create one. Uh, what became KwaZulu. But there was a very real fear among KwaZulu officials that allowing even part of Ngwanguma to break away would inspire others to consider themselves ethnic minorities within KwaZulu to do the same. In the face of the land transfers, other chiefs in this region, um, the Matembo chief and Nuayo, which are to the north and south respectively, who had previously supported in Tunja the deposed chief, and who actually previously enjoyed close relations with the Swazi king, reversed their position and presented themselves unequivocally as part of KwaZulu and as subjects of the Zulu king. By the middle of the 1970s, KwaZulu very much constructed its legitimacy based on this myth that Shaka Zulu had conquered all of what was now the province of Natal. These chiefs echoed this myth, going through great pain, pains to explain how their ancestors had ponzed or paid political loyalty or tribute to Zulu and never Swazi kings. This is a rather abrupt shift. These two chiefs had previously supported the pro Swazi um, Ntunja claim to the Ngoma Zulu chieftaincy. And they frequently traveled to Swaziland to meet with King Sabuza II when they're summoned. Throughout the 20th century, all three of these trans Mongola chieftaincies that we see in the um, left hand side of the map, even at times, were paid stipends by the Swazi royal house. By the mid 1970s, however, as rumors circulate that this region could be transferred to Swaziland, Claiming Zulu ethnicity becomes a strategy for people to avoid losing South African citizenship. So these testimonies demonstrate how claiming specific ethnic identities at certain times become a survival strategy in Nguanguma as the political and territorial ambitions of KwaZulu and Swaziland begin to clash. The South African government, by the end of this entire committee um, process, realizes that they have made a mistake. Many government officials had come to believe that the people in this area are actually Swazi, and that they had made a mistake by ousting Ntunja and appointing Swayo as chief. However, given that the ousted chief now faced criminal charges in South Africa, and there were rumors that some of his followers in Swaziland had joined the Pan-African Congress, an anti-apartheid organization, he simply could not be restored. Instead, the government of South Africa dug in. They decided to reinforce Kakrayo as chief by funneling extra development funds through him and by demarcating and reinforcing the border with Swaziland. One of the things that I think is interesting here is even though historically half of the chief's followers have lived on the other side of the border, nowhere in these recommendations will the committee acknowledge the transnational kind of political affiliations that happened in this chiefdom, that followers of the Ingomazulu chief, actually some of them lived in Swaziland. The committee recommended that the South African government disregard any pleas 
um, from Ingwa Vuma's people or leaders that their area be transferred to either Swaziland or Kangane, writing that, quote, this would only lead to confrontation with the KwaZulu border, end quote. Largely in order to stabilize the KwaZulu Bantistan, the government chose to treat this chiefdom and Ingwa as a whole as unequivocally Zulu. So just to kind of step back and sum this up, the creation of KwaZulu and the independence of Swaziland created new political pressures in this border district. For claimants to the Ingwa Zulu chieftaincy, the KwaZulu and Swaziland governments and notions of Zulu and Swazi identity provided new political tools to assert their legitimacy. Uh, both chiefs appealed to leaders of more powerful polities, one to a newly created Bantistan and the other to a newly independent post-colonial state. For the KwaZulu government, supporting Kaswayo, who fashions himself as a pro-KwaZulu chief, was a means of imposing and encouraging Zulu nationalism within KwaZulu. For the Swazi government, supporting Ntunja provides an avenue to stake their claim on what they saw as their long lost territory. And while notions of Zulu and Swazi identity remain incredibly complicated on the ground here, the apartheid government approaches and interprets this as a primordial battle over identity. Ultimately, they choose to treat this area as Zulu in order to reinforce the authority of the newly created KwaZulu Bantistan. Soon, however, by the early 1980s, the political landscape is going to again shift, leading South Africa to reverse its position. And by the 1980s, as later in this chapter will show, transferring Ingwanguma to Swaziland and reversing their position and treating it as Swazi emerges as a way for South Africa to attempt to gain Swaziland as a buffer against the threat of anti-apartheid forces on South Africa's border. Thank you. Thank you. Wait till we stop share and then introduce our final panelist. Great, thank you, Ashley. Uh, so last up, we have Victoria Rovine at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, who is uh, speaking on the mobility of the pith helmet, a colonial accessory in France and French West Africa. Okay, I am unmuted, right? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Um, a 1931 French photograph introduces the headwear that is my subject, offering a sighting of this canonically colonial object, the pith helmet, in its native habitat. The photograph was taken in Kemeni, a small town in what was then the Sudan Francais, today Mali, the largest of the colonies that together constituted Afrique Occidentale Francaise or French West Africa. Two white men stand in the foreground, their garments tailored, tucked, and fully buttoned. Behind them, two dark-skinned men dressed in loose-fitting gowns are barely discernible literally and figuratively on the margins. Dominating much of the image is an architectural structure whose small stature, organic lines, and craggy surface clearly distinguish it from European forms. In the French context where this image appeared, this scene would be read as clearly elsewhere, as evidence of the expansiveness of France's, France's interwar overseas empire. The photograph portrays the French ethnographer Marcel Griol and his colleague Michel Léry at work, documenting, collecting, and classifying African cultures. The pith helmets that punctuate this scene are the clearest element of its colonial iconography, perfectly suited to a photograph that features all of the elements of the quintessentially colonial, an exotic setting populated by white European male protagonists with the community's inhabitants present but relegated to the background. The pith helmet retains its ties to modern colonial cultures into the present. Indeed, the pith helmet signified the colonies in Europe just as it signified Europe in the colonies. Through close readings of images, descriptions, reactions, and occasionally absences, 
My larger project, of which this is a part, explores the pith helmet as an index of imperial power and of its limits. The same garment also served Europeans in the metropole, where images of the helmet, such as this very image, circulated in popular media. Depictions of Natalie dressed and helmeted French officials, soldiers, researchers, and sundry other French travelers served the French government's pro-colonial propaganda, which aimed to project a vision of the colonies as, quote, exotic, yet integrated into national identity. In the 1920s, a poster promoting French service in the colonial military exemplifies the Pith Helmet's prominence amid the iconography of empire. At its center, an apple-cheeked French soldier unfurls a text that describes all the incentives to join the service. His luminously white Pith Helmet contrasts with his brown uniform, encircling his head and projecting upward, set off visually by the blue expanse of water in the background. Female figures of diverse complexions and dress styles surround him, representing France's colonies in West, Central, and North Africa, as well as Asia. For the subjects of colonial rule as well, the helmet evoked the colonial regime. In his novel memoir of his work as an interpreter for the French administration in the 1920s and 30s, renowned Malian writer Amadou Ampate Ba born and raised in the Dogon region where Griol conducted much of his research, described the common reaction of members of his own community to the site of the headwear. Quote, as soon as one saw a white man wearing a pith helmet, even if the helmet was dirty and discolored, one thought of one thing, run and fetch chicken, eggs, butter, and milk, and offer them to Mr. Helmet Wearer like a mystical offering. Ba embeds a tinge of skepticism into his description of reactions to the pith helmet. The wearer of the helmet may not deserve the respect his hat demands, for he may not have the self-respect to keep his own attire clean. The helmet's associations with colonial rule sit easily on Griol's head, for he was known for his martial bearing and his aggressive approach to fieldwork. These associations did not suit his colleague Michel Léry, who would later publish an anguished account of this research. This photograph centers on Griol as the leader of the era's most famous ethnographic ex expedition, the Mission Dakar de Djibouti of 1931 to 33, during which a team of French social scientists spent two months in Dogon communities before continuing across the continent for the next 18 months. This photograph of Griol and Liri appeared in the French press soon after the mission concluded, published in the surrealist-oriented art literature ethnography journal Minotaur, in a 1933 special issue devoted to the Mission Dakar de Djibouti. Of the approximately 150 photographs in this issue, this was the sole image that included any members of the research team. And you see it here in the upper right on, um, in that issue of Minotaur. For French readers, such images confirmed the Pith Helmet's association with their compatriots in the colonies. A passage in L'Afrique Fantôme, Léry's memoir of his experiences as part of the mission, describes the moment captured by this photograph. Griol and Liri stand before a shrine that held a spiritually powerful and for Griol ethnographically valuable mask. Determined to acquire this mask, Griol used threats and bullying to pressure the community's leaders before finally stealing the object with Liri's help. Liri described the scene, quote, Griol declared, tell the village chief he must hand over the Como mask for 10 francs, or the police who were supposedly hidden in the truck would take him and other community leaders to San, a nearby town, to explain themselves to the colonial administration. Thus, Griol intentionally elided his authority with that of the colonial administrators, facilitated by his pith helmet's association with French officialdom. Through their collections gathered by legitimate as well as illegitimate means, Griol and his colleagues presented West African cultures, especially the Dogon, through key objects that, quote, unlocked entire systems of thought, social structures, spiritual beliefs, and thus the whole of existence. I propose to reverse this view, making the pith helmet my ethnographic key. 
Although headwear was just one among a great many elements of Dogon material culture Griol and his colleagues addressed in their exhaustive research, it figured prominently in the diffusion of their work. For example, the first article of the special issue of Minotaur opens with a large photograph of a Dogon man's head and shoulders placed above the title at the page's center and starkly outlined on a white ground. The caption identifies the man as Tabillon, one of the team's informants. Facing away from the viewer, Tabillon is presented in a three-quarter view, foregrounding his white cap. This is more a portrait of a hat than of a man. Dogon headwear also appeared in other popular press coverage of the Mission, such as in this 1933 newspaper article that heralded the return of the expedition illustrated with two portraits of anonymous Dogon men in profile, each wearing a distinctive hat. Headwear appears in the Griol team's academic publications as well. For example, these diagrams of hats in Geneviève Griol's analysis of Dogon dress, published in 1951. This attention to hats, however, did not include one notable and for the researchers familiar genre. In L'Afrique Fantôme, Lyrie provides rich descriptions of the pith helmets incorporation into West African dress. Lyrie was impressed by the attire of a district chief who completed his ensemble with a helmet. And this is not a, a, the district chief, but this, this man here, this farmer, uh, evokes the description in the Lyrie. So Lyrie describes the district chief, quote, physically very tall and slender with a handsome dark complexion, an entirely indigenous outfit, a large dark blue boo-boo or gown, and sandals, a little amulet wrapped in leather dangling on his chest, with the exception of a beige pith helmet worn with great distinction. The pith helmet appeared again in Lyrie's description of Baba Keita, a Malinke man who facilitated the researchers' work in the Dogon region. Lyrie paints a vivid picture, quote, Baba Keita is coming, white espadrilles, impeccable white suit with an officer style stand up collar, a slightly too large pith helmet, which he fixed using strips of paper taken from an issue of La Dépêche Coloniale, borrowed from me for this purpose, and perfecting his outfit, a belted European winter coat and a freshly shaved head. Keita's effort to resize his pith helmet, inserting sheets of newspaper, appropriately a colonial themed newspaper, La Dépêche Coloniale, attests to the value he placed on this accessory. The elements of his ensemble are more disparate than those of the district chief whose, quote, entirely indigenous outfit incorporated just one non-indigenous element, the helmet he wore, quote, with distinction. Lerie's portrayal of Keita, on the other hand, is inflected with bemusement at this African man's use of a Western style of Western style garments in combinations that defied French conventions, a white military styled suit with white sandals topped with a winter coat whose belt we imagine was cinched tight. The helmet is here quite literally ill suited to its West African wearer, requiring a makeshift resizing. These descriptions of pith helmets in combination with West African attire or with Western attire in unconventional styles did not appear in the official publications of the Griol team. The pith helmets on their own heads projected the power accorded Europeans in this colonial setting. On the heads of West Africans, the helmet signaled a potential threat to the very foundation of that setting. From its earliest incarnations, this white domed headwear has embodied a key paradox of modern empire and its aftermath, the simultaneity of dominance and dependence, authority and vulnerability. The pith helmet was initially developed as a form of protection for the heads of white Europeans against a threat they couldn't hope to avoid, the son of the colonies. Thus, it was an acknowledgement of the weakness of white bodies. For French as well as other European sojourners in the colonies, this headwear became a talisman that evoked the security of the metropole when far from home. Pith helmets were and are made in a variety of styles, yet the basic form is recognizable across variations and geographies. 
The ubiquity of the helmet reflects the fear the colonial sun inspired in Europeans as the foremost among many threats to their well being in West Africa and other hot climates. Physician Auguste Vallet, a medical officer in the French colonial forces, used dramatic language to describe the sun's dangers in a 1917 article on tropical African pathology. Vallet presented the colonies as a menace to European bodies for, quote, the sun, king of the tropics, absolute master of his empire, doesn't want white people to come and defy him in his territory. He is a constant, implacable enemy from whom there are no, for whom there are no seasons. There is no truce, no rest, from whom there is no escape. The pith helmet, he declared, quote, must be worn at all times, no matter where the sun appears in the sky. The archives of French West Africa are replete with references to the inseparability of Europeans from their helmets. The Pip helmet's omnipresence made it an object of occasional skepticism, even in colonial themed press outlets. In 1931, an anonymous article on the history of the Pip helmet appeared in Les Annales Coloniales. The author disdainfully refers to faith in the helmet's protective properties as a, quote, superstition asserting that French visitors and, and um, officials in the colonies had created a, quote, casque fetiche, or a helmet fetish. The choice of the term fetiche to describe the French wearers of the pith helmet recalls the European mischaracterization of African religion as forms of idolatry and superstition, attributing spiritual power to and even worshiping objects. The anonymous author used fetiche to accuse his own compatriots of worshiping the pith helmet, a strong reproach, perhaps tinged with an implication that these helmet worshipers had, quote, gone native by imbuing the headwear with amulet-like protective powers. Along with his com condemnation of the French casque fetiche, the author denounces Africans who wear the helmet, declaring, the lowest servant, the lowest cook, the lowest driver has his helmet. This and other French reactions to the Pip Helmet's incorporation into West Africans' attire reflect a concern that Stoller and Cooper describe as, quote, a basic tension of empire. That is the assertion of distinctions between colonizer and colonized in which, quote, a, gram a grammar of difference was continuously and vigilantly crafted, end quote by the colonial regime. Clothing was a clear visual marker that was, along with skin color, central to the French administration's representation of the diversity of peoples who incorporated into their empire. For colonial officials and their like-minded compatriots, the blurring of dress categories was a source of concern, for it signaled the unsettling of hierarchies. The appearance of pith helmets on the heads of West Africans provoked particular comment and criticism in French mass media. In 1912, a French journalist visiting um, French West Africa described a scene in Rufisque, a town near Dakar, using headwear to survey the city's inhabitants. Quote, some wear turbans of blue cotton, some wear the fez, some caps in faded velvet. Others, seduced by the beauties of civilization, wear heterogeneous styles, workmen's caps, even pith helmets the supreme ambition of urban natives. The pith helmet thus invoked the supposed impulsivity of consumers who covet the trappings of European so-called civilization. French observers also complained that West Africans wore the headwear incorrectly, as in a 1928 commentary on dress in Dakar, quote, let us point out some sartorial particularities. The shirt is usually worn over the pants with shirt tails billowing. Pith helmets are never lost and always wind up on the head of a native who often feels the need to paint it. One of them had a periwinkle hue, another gave his a, bl his a black coat of black paint. This last must have seemed the height of scientific ignorance and sartorial subversion, for the black surface would draw in rather than repel the heat of the sun. A 1931 photograph of a street scene in Douala then the capital of French Cameroon seems to exemplify the French conception of the pith helmet as supreme ambition of their African subjects. Captioned, 
Douala à l'Européen, or Douala European style, the photograph captures three main figures all walking on a crowded street. Two of the people at the image's center walk toward us, a woman in a white dress with white stockings. Behind her walks a man in a sharply fitted suit jacket, bow tie, trilby style hat, and immaculate white pants. The woman looks toward the man walking past her, the third and largest figure in this frame. His back is to us as he strides away, wearing what appears to be a tight fitting riding jacket, jodhpurs, his lower legs wrapped in pooties, carrying a cane in one hand, his other hand in his jacket pocket. He wears a large pith helmet, its color and shape unmistakable, its impact apparent in the woman's gaze in his direction. The man's bearing, shoulders back, cane swinging, communicate his sense of importance. The caption, along with the description of the pith helmet's irresistibility, seem to connect the image to the narrative of the profligate native encouraging readers to see this elegantly dressed resident of Douala through the eyes of skeptical French observers. Despite such disapproval, often seasoned with sarcasm, images of West Africans wearing the pith helmet occasionally served the interests of the French administration, for this accessory could extend the reach of French power when worn with the tacit or explicit imprimatur of the administration. The rare West African who gained a high governmental position might wear the helmet to signal that status. For example, in a photograph that appeared in a 1936 issue of Les Annales Coloniales, a Senegalese journalist and politician Ngalandu Diouf stands beside the French Minister of Colonies and the Governor General of French West Africa. All three wear pith helmets, befitting their positions of power within the colonial administration. De Copé, the Minister of Colonies, and Moutet, the Governor General, or sorry, the Governor General of the um, French West Africa, as the representatives of the French central government in the colonies, Diouf, elected to the French National Assembly in 1934 as the deputy from the four commune towns in Senegal, whose special status granted them this representation. The pith helmet conveys prestige not impetuous consumption or a dangerous elision of social and racial categories. From Kemeny and Paris to Dakar and Douala, pith helmets made visible colonial structures of difference. Whether on French or West African heads, this headwear's associations with specific histories of Europe European hegemony make it no mere accessory. The pith helmet evoked the steep barriers of racial hierarchies and political divides, and it provided a tool for traversing or attempting to, to traverse those barriers. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. So uh, we technically have about 17 minutes left. Let's take questions from three people um, and then we'll let our panelists answer and then see if we have time to take some more questions. Okay, so Aaron McKinnon, anybody else with a hand up now? Okay, Aaron McKinnon, Alice Burmeister, and then if nobody else sticks a hand up later, I will ask some questions as well. So let's go to Aaron and then Alice. <laughs> Great, thank you. I, I really enjoyed these papers, um, some incredibly rich detail um, and uh, insights in all of them. So very quickly, um, I have two sort of comments slash questions. Um, one is for Ashley. Um, I don't know if you've had an opportunity. I mean, for me, this was a wonderful tour down memory lane. I'm very familiar with that region. Um, and I looked at many of the same questions, but at an earlier point of time, I was just wondering if you had had a chance to look at the um, infamous Zululand Lands Delimitation Commission report. So, you know, I think that there, there, there's a lot of rich detail about many of the questions you're dealing with, Tonga land, Maputa land relations there. Um, and, and related to that, there's, there's the, the wonderful insights from Paulina Lamini on her sense of two monarchies, two kingdoms in that experience there. Um, but, and this is a question I'm going to kind of shift in both directions, both for Ashley and Victoria. Um, wonder what the view from the other side of the equation 
is in both of these stories. Um, you know, what do the Swazi have to say about that contested territory in Ashley's case? And, and in Victoria's very interesting course, and I, it made me think of Oxford bags, because in the context of studies I've done, it was the Oxford bag that was the marker of similar kind of colonial um, imprimatur. But I'm wondering about how Africans viewed, especially other Africans who wore the pith helmet. Was there a kind of interest in that dress, um, an appropriation, or what were the ambiguities? And I also, maybe I missed it, but I, I also wondered if there was gender at all in your story. Great, so Alice, you can go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was thinking we'd cluster all the questions and then let the, the panelists respond, so, okay. Okay, um, uh, great panel, really lots of interesting um, papers and information. Uh, my question's directed toward Vicki um, and, uh, First of all, I, I feel like I've learned so much about pith helmets. I had no idea <laughs> the history of this and how they were used and photographed. I mean, really fascinating stuff. My question is a little bit geared toward, um, if you could speak a little bit perhaps about um, examples where the pith helmet may have been incorporated into African art or uh, visual works or performances, um, perhaps as a symbol of, um, as a way of making fun or satirizing colonial authority. Um, and a, a, another kind of uh, additional question linked to that is, I know I happen to know that you um, do a lot of work in um, contemporary fashion. And I'm just wondering if the pith helmet has appeared in contemporary fashion in any way, um, either in, in a, you know, a ironic or satirizing way or comedic way, or, or maybe even as a, a serious, accessory in contemporary fashion. I was just wondering if you had any examples that you could share with us about that. Thank you. So I am going to use my chair's prerogative and ask one question to everybody. Uh, so Elizabeth, um, I, I thought your case was, was fascinating. Um, uh, I wondered if your case study told us something about this enduring idea of wealth and people. And I was really compelled by your argument uh, that when women made too many apprentices, it made their profession uh, not as prestigious, right? Um, and thinking about sort of commodities and wealth of people and what's happening with this apprenticeship system. Uh, uh, Molly, um, I had a question, especially that picture you showed of, uh, um, you know, with the reference to bribe lice, um, how, does, how does this safari culture let English speaking white South Africans pretend to be Afrikaners, <laughs> you know, and how much of a dynamic is at play in that. And especially because Afrikaners also have, you know, great trek reenactments, all those other ways of sort of asserting their, you know, sort of pilgrimages of place, right? Um, and then, uh, um, Ashley, I had a question about um, migrant work and the history of migrant work in this region as something that destabilizes borders and as something that is so often associated with driving ethnicity, right, um, in Southern Africa and elsewhere. And then uh, I, uh, Vicky, I wondered if the pith helmet tells us something different about the limits of assimilation. You know, there have been so many critiques of the idea of assimilation um, in French colonies, uh, but does the pith helmet tell us something new about what assimilation did or didn't mean? And then whoever wants to answer first, um, can go ahead. I'll go first, that's fine. Um, so um, Aaron, your question about um, responses of Africans to other Africans wearing pith helmets. And I have, um, and I'm focusing really on the interwar period, I should clarify here, right? So 1920s and 30s mostly. Um, and I have some references to it, both in Paris where Afri you know, West Africans as students and, and others, um, I have some, um, especially literary references to um, the, the sort of character of the African who has gone Western, we might say, instead of the French person gone native, and often in um, sort of a critical mode, you know, that this is, um, I'm thinking about um, Camera Lai and others writing about um, mm, sort of the, the, the masquerade of the West African in full, you might say colonial drag, you know, wearing the pith helmet and everything else. Um, in, in the um, sort of archival work that I've been doing that's focused on West Africa, 
um, I have scattered bits and pieces of responses of people in West Africa responding to the site of other Africans in pit helmets, but I frankly don't have a whole lot of specific responses. In terms of gender, what's interesting is the way um, European, in my case, I'm focusing on French, women wore the pith helmet with as much consistency as, of course, French men did. And I have lots of references in letters and, and whatnot to French women talking about how they decorated their pith helmets to make them match their dresses and things like that. I've seen nothing on um, West African women wearing pith helmets that hasn't arisen at all. Um, Alice's question about the pith helmet in African art and how it's been sort of absorbed, that's a great question. It makes me think of, I have a slide of um, the um, use of pith helmets reproduced in wood, in some cases covered with gold leaf, if we're looking at Akan-related cultures in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, as a uh, sort of a uh, an emblematic power form that could be placed on a shrine or, or something like that. Um, and um, also people using pith helmets, I think of in, this is a French film, but it's West Africans in Niger, I'm sure you know well, Jean Rouch and Les Maîtres Fous, and the uh, wearing of pith helmets in kind of a possession state, right? So yes. there's another, yeah, which is a great example. And um, in contemporary fashion, that's a great question. I haven't seen it, not in West Africa, but in Southern Africa, I have in terms of so-called safari style. There are some designers in South Africa, especially, who've moved the pith helmet into contemporary fashion in that context. Is it ironic? I don't think so, actually. It could be, but I don't think it is. And then, um, about uh, Lauren's question about the limits of assimilation. I mean, I think what the pith helmet gives us a chance to see is the French endeavor, most sometimes successful, we don't see the unsuccessful nearly as much as we see the successful to control assimilation, right? So there can be slippage where the pith helmet slips through without the um, endorsement of the French. But we also see it born, as I mentioned at the end of the paper, with the endorsement of the French, right? So it's like, it's sometimes okay, and sometimes it's slipping beyond the bounds of French, uh, sort of French classification systems. So. Yes, I'll jump in next. Um, so I guess I'll start with uh, Lauren's question about, you know, migrant work as something that destabilized borders um, and it contributes to formation of ethnicity. So I haven't looked at that angle a lot. So obviously this entire region is caught up within migrant labor networks. Um, what I have found is in looking at the 1970s, 1980s, there seems to be a lot of fear of Hmong people in England Vuma that if the land transfer happens, they will lose their ability to work in South Africa. Um, but in terms of kind of longer histories of labor migration, I think that's something I need to look into more. Um, and England Vuma is kind of a district that I just started really looking into just for this new chapter. Um, for Aaron, right? Okay, perfect. Um, so in drafting the chapter, I looked at a lot of the British correspondence from the 1890s in addition to the um, newer archival material um, from the 1970s and 1980s. I looked at the Zululand um, Delimitations Commission actually a couple of years ago for an article I did on betterment, um, but I haven't actually looked at it for this chapter. So I'm going to go back to my scans of all that material um, and start thinking about it. Um, so thank you for reminding me of that. I'll jump in. Um, thank you for that. Uh, question, Lauren, and I'm actually really excited that you asked that. Um, it's the subject of a related article uh, that I'm working on that compares and contrasts uh, English speaking and Afrikaans masculinity uh, in relation to safari. And I think what you see as the big difference that connects the British on safari to the idea of empire versus the Afrikaner is the question of autochthony. Um, the British were really not that interested, um, even as South Africans, um, in making that same claim to autochthony. 
that the Afrikaners always have this very ambivalent kind of connection to um, in the sense that they are African, but they are European. And so the safari is very much connected to the history of the treks and their own history and the way that they see uh, themselves. Whereas the British, it's much more related to this kind of heroic conservationism and this kind of modernity that Britain brings to the world. And so it's much more connected to, to a British conception of, of imperial modernity, whereas the Afrikaner um, approach to safari is very much connected to the land. I would argue it is still this way, um, particularly if you look at contemporary Afrikaner caravan culture um, is, is still a very big deal. Um, and, and it's connected to this kind of return to history in a way that the British ideal isn't. It's connected more to the scouting, to the adventure, to the, the sense of bravery, um, especially embodied by people like, like Sellis or Cornwallis Harris um, that, that really put safari on the map. Um, so it is a very different approach. And so I wouldn't necessarily say it allows them to be Afrikaners, but it allows them to be different types of South Africans, um, if that makes sense. All right, um, okay, well, um, in response to that question about the sort of like the influx of apprentices and how that affects the, the prestige of tailoring, I mean, I think that there's a few processes going on here. Um, one is that, you know, as in any profession, I think, um, in multiple places around the world, you see that once women enter it into it, right, the prestige sort of like of it goes down as do wages and whatnot. So on one hand, that's happening um, to tailoring in the 70s and 80s, but also women in their strategy to amass multiple um, many, many apprentices are creating a system in which um, girls who finish apprentices, apprenticeships have had less sort of like interaction with a master, right? So if you have 40 girls in a workshop as opposed to older models where people only had three or four and they could really work with their master, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, sort of learning the skills that just with that many people, that many bodies in a workshop, um, there's the perception that the, that the, the final material or the final goods that people are making are not as good. Um, and that's also a reflection of sort of like changing global, the, the changing global market for inputs as in, you know, the 90s particular and the 2000s, you have this move towards really cheap fabric coming in from Asia that people are making more outfits, right? But they're making more outfits of lesser quality. Um, so there, all of this is going on to sort of reduce the, the prestige of tailoring and the opportunity that it presents for individuals. Great, thank you. So because Stacy Sewell, one of our esteemed organizers actually told me that the biggest issue is that we're done before 3.30, I will open it up to a one more round of questions. Um, so I've got Carly Forbes, uh, and if anybody else just wants to stick your hand up if you wanna ask something. Sorry, I don't know, is it in Jerry Marikia Cleveland? Is what I see on the- uh, Yes, correct. correct. Okay. Uh, my, and then my, sorry, Kathy Skidmore has, so we'll go Carly, so we'll go in that order. Okay, so Carly first. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for your papers. This was really great. Um, my question is probably largely based off of being Vicky's student, but it's for Elizabeth about um, right at the beginning of your talk, you talked about textiles being used to assert status and authority. And I wonder if you see, in addition to these imported printed cloths, if you see the tailors tailoring any locally made cloth and what that might look like in any kind of gendered setting. Great, and then in Jerry Mary Kia Cleveland. Uh, yes, uh, my question is to Molly. How is the idea of safaris and pristine national parks play, playing out in post-apartheid South Africa. Thank you. And then Kathy. My question is to Molly as well. 
And my question is about the safari itself, because there are different types of safaris and they play to different audiences. Um, so you have your caravan people, um, and then you have this sort of global audience of safari. Um, and um, how do you see those as interacting in terms of class and content? and technology. Great. So it doesn't matter to me who goes first in answering, but just whoever wants to go. Um, all right. Thank you both uh, very much uh, for those questions. Um, so in terms of safari and pristine parks in post-apartheid South Africa, um, that's still something that I'm very much working on, um, really have only looked at the secondary literature and then of course, plus my own just experiences uh, of that. But I mean, it is still largely, um, I mean, the majority of tourists are white. Uh, the majority of tourists are either white South Africans or from global, uh, you know, they're international tourists, sorry. And so it's very interesting to me to start thinking um, about those things, um, especially because most of the park staff is Black African. And you still have this concept of the pristine park. It is still presented as this is the way Africa, you know, used to be. And you haven't really had, for the most part, a lot of effort to put in the history of the park, the fact that people did live here. Um, there's some effect to that. There is um, actually a really nice little museum uh, at Skakuza Camp in Stevenson Hamilton's um, former uh, house, but how many people actually go there, right? So there are actually these historical sites, but there's nothing to really direct the tourists to that. Um, it's still very much kind of about the animals. And so that's something that I really wanna think about, especially because you know, it, tourism is such a huge uh, economic draw, uh, not just for South Africa, but for Botswana, for Namibia, um, Zambia, Zimbabwe, all of these areas. Um, and so how much does a certain type of history, does a certain projection of nature need to be maintained in order to continue this, this economic uh, funding? So that's a really good question. I'm sorry if I don't have a very good answer. Uh, to it. Um, Kathy, yes, thank you for that question. It's very interesting to me, uh, the different types of safaris, because there, I mean, there are such a range, um, and they really are connected to class, but I think also to ethnicity um, and also to uh, nationality. Um, you know, you've got the camping people who are, are largely, and, and generation, right? You got the campers who are largely like the broke college student uh, kind of age. The caravans are huge with the Afrikaners. Um, and this is something that I really want to look into, but I mean, is that the modern Asaba? I mean, is it the modern ox wagon, right? Does it allow for this sort of pilgrimage? Um, and that's very connected in the literature. Um, I have this great book about the first Europeans in the Kruger National Park, um, and it's all about the Dutch. Um, and then, of course, you've got sort of the more traditional rondavels and that sort of thing to the huge international tourist groups that go and stay at these resorts. And then finally, you've got like the, the Brangelina style glamping, you know, that's just so over the top, like let's reinvent out of Africa. You know, Robert Redford may as well show up at your bedside, uh, young and beautiful, like that sort of thing. And it really is, I think, connected very much to those those facets of class, nationality, uh, and age. And it's, it's kind of interesting to start thinking about those more in historical terms, especially when much of the tourism, um, particularly in the, the 20th century up to the end of apartheid, is largely coming either from within Southern Africa itself um, or coming particularly from Britain um, and the United States uh, and how that will change as sanctions on apartheid uh, 
um, become tougher? And then how will it change after apartheid when there's a more global explosion uh, of interest in visiting South Africa? So yeah, great questions. All stuff that I'm really starting to think about um, and I appreciate it. Great, right. well, um, thanks for that question about um, woven cloth and you know the way that it, it's tailored. Uh, I think about this a lot in my early in the earlier parts of my project. Uh, so this this area, what was the Kingdom of Dahomey, sort of like sits at a crossroads of kind of two weaving cultures um, or two weaving practices. So you have people that you know men using horizontal looms um, like a con speaker, as, and then you have uh, women and men using vertical looms. And so m this this uh, fabric in the early part is mostly used, being worn as like a wrapper, right? Uh, but in the 30s and 40s, there's, you know, amid sort of global textile shortages, there's a turn towards woven cloth, um, which Fawn referred to as botoyi, this like subpar woven cloth. And so when tailored fitted dress becomes extremely popular in the 50s, um, it's sort of like a rejection of the, you know, austerity or the poverty that they associate with the botoyi. Right. And so, you know, people describe this as like, oh, we had to wear botoyi, but now we're wearing, um, you know, fitted dress. And the, the type of fitted dress that really becomes popular, um, you know, doesn't the material qualities of woven cloth, right? It's inelasticity and sort of like its tendency to fray don't map on well to certain types of tailored dress. Um, so there are certain outfits that people associate with um, festivals and whatnot, um, you know, traditional dress that will be made out of um, woven, locally woven cloth. But in the period that I'm talking about, that I talked about today uh, and up until the present, most, you know, most uh, outfits are tailored out of imported cloth and woven, woven fabric is used, you know, as head wraps or to, to bind babies as sort of like accessories on um, main outfits. So. so Ashley or Vicki, do you have anything else you wanna wrap up with? No? I didn't know if you all got any more questions. I lost count, but I, so I think, I think we're, I think we're good. Um, let's give everybody a round of applause for this amazing panel. I feel so lucky that I got to listen to all these papers. Um, and now, um, yeah, thank you all. And we're done. Thanks, Lauren. Yep. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you all.